Uh, namaste, everyone. Uh, I'm actually uh, feeling a little nervous because all the people that I admire and regard as my teachers are in the audience, many of them. Uh, so, well, I'm, I'm also very honored that uh, I'm getting this opportunity to speak uh, in front of them. So my topic is a little different and I'm actually glad that this is uh, after lunch because it's a very unappetizing and <laughs> unpalatable topic. So it's good that you got over with lunch. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the best practices in Indic hygiene, sanitation and environmental protection. Uh, how did modern sanitation lose its way? So modern sanitation is a work of genius. I mean, it is. if you look at the way it is designed, you will marvel at the way it, it works. And the first thing that is a the genius, uh, work of genius is the flush toilet. Because with one press of the flush handle, which uses about 10 to 20 liters of water, all that unwanted stuff that you produce goes somewhere, you cannot see where it went, you don't know what happened to it, and you can live in peace. But if only you knew what happened to it. Uh, so this, I'm calling this a modern invention, though even in the Harappan times there was a certain version of this, but nowhere as harmful uh, as this. So, uh, so when you flush and uh, you send it out of the house, uh, it is supposed to go to a modern wastewater treatment plant. And look at how elaborate it is. Uh, so there is, uh, there is a, a, a screening where the solids are removed just by screening, and then there is a primary treatment where they, uh, the bigger particles are settled down, and then there is a chemical treatment, then there, you know, there's bacteria working on it, whole lot of things. Now, if you uh, think about it, what we have done is we have used, we have mixed water, clean water, with solids, with dirty things, with, with, uh, with poisonous things. We mix them, and then we send it far away to a treatment plant where we will separate them using a whole lot of energy. A whole lot of energy is now needed at all, all those steps that you are seeing, are, it, uh, they are happening because there is a whole lot of water that has to be removed. Uh, and then from those solids, we are trying to remove the most harmful of them, and then you, you know, we are trying to make it less harmful, and then we don't know what to do with it. Because uh, in, the, in, the, in a city, for example, uh, they just uh, they, they treat the wastewater, they remove the solids, then they send the wastewater to some river. It goes to some river, some water body, and there it is, it's, it, uh, by dilution, uh, we think that dilution is the, doing the job. So that's the way it's, uh, it is supposed to work, the, the genius of uh, wastewater treatment that we have. It's a totally flawed paradigm when you look at it. First of all, there's a huge cost of digging underground uh, and installing those sievers which take all the wastewater, the bath water, the kitchen wastewater, various wastewater uh, is carried through sievers. So it's, an, uh, it's a huge investment that has to be made by governments of every country, every city. Large amounts of energy needed to separate solids from water. Why were they mixed in the first place? And cities are struggling to find finance for sewers treatment plants. And meanwhile, when they're still struggling, the, the waste is still going to rivers and seas because they, as when water comes, people will of course use the water to clean themselves. So there will be wastewater. And where it is going, we don't know until they find the finance to build the sewers and the treatment plants. So that's the way it works. There is also the problem of nutrient recovery, which I'll deal with in detail. So there's a sanitation crisis, massive crisis, large amounts of wastewater, or what is now called used water, because we want to reuse it. So we are saying, let's not call it wastewater, we'll call it used water. So used water from homes, commercial establishments, industries, farmlands, they're flowing into rivers, seas, and other water bodies without proper treatment. Fecal sludge and solid waste are finding their way into the food chain. Obviously, if they go into the water, and if they are being used for irrigation, and they, so they are also going into food. This is having a serious impact on human health, education, and economy. So you, if you read the news reports about India, a lot of it will be to do with, uh, you know, with pollution, which is caused by the kind of toilets that we are using, actually, and of course, what we the fertilizers and all which are going into the uh, into fields and then with the water they get into the rivers where the rainwater goes into them so you will have read about all the sewage which is going into hardwar uh, you know into ganga right because cities are all having these modern treatment uh, modern uh, sanitation systems but they don't have the treatment plants ready yet so the the wastewater is all going into these holy rivers but don't think that it's happening only in India. Let me tell you that this is happening in the developed countries also, but at a different level. 
So, because developed countries often have a combined sewer system, so where rainwater and sewage go into the same, uh, the same channel. And so, when there's too much of rainfall, all that overflows and then that also gets into the rivers, seas and land, also goes into land. This happened recently in Virginia when there was some sewage dumping in uh, 2017. And this has been happening in London too, in Thames River, and it's only now they found a solution to that. Now, the nutrient problem that I was telling you about, uh, our food contains nutrients which plants have taken from the soil, right? We take, get nutrients from the, so, uh, from the uh, food that we eat and then we excrete them because we don't use all of it. A great, great part, part of it goes from the urine, goes into the wastewater, goes into the uh, treatment plant where it is not uh, separated and then it goes into, it is not used again. It just goes into rivers and seas. Now, urine contains valuable phosphate, nitrogen, potassium and other nutrients which should get back into nature. So, we are not doing that and instead of that, we are mining for phosphate, we are trying to get all the fertilizers chemically and then using that for our plants, for our crops. There are only rare instances of nutrients being recovered for agriculture via the, sea, the modern sewage disposal system. So, developed countries, some of them, yes, they are actually recovering phosphate, they're recovering nitrogen, then they're making fertilizers, sending it back to the farmers. But that's very rare. Most of it is going waste. So, and we are, India, for example, is importing fertilizers. Importing fertilizers is causing a drain on countries like India because phosphorus reserves are confined to a few countries. Currently, India imports 90% of its requirement for phosphate fertilizers. Uh, US imports about 85% of its potash and 50% of its nitrogen um, fertilizers. So, this nutrients, uh, nutrient recovery is totally messed up because of the modern uh, wastewater system. This, to put it simply, humans are going through the elaborate process of mining and processing to manufacture fertilizers um, and applying them to crops. Then we are, when we get the food, we lose it all through wastewater. And then we again manufacture new fertilizers. That's the way we are doing it. Then lakes and streams which are rece receiving an excess of nutrients from wastewater are suffering from oxygen depletion and fish kills because that's why you get all this water hyacinth growing in, uh, in, body, in water bodies where there's too much of uh, there's wastewater coming in and then the fish die in that kind of water. The synthetic uh, fertilizer manufacturing uh, business is also very energy intensive. So that's another source of pollution. It, it, occur, it consumes energy and it uh, contributes to greenhouse gases. That's another issue. And this is an endless thing because our population is growing. Now I will come to the Indic understanding of hygiene and uh, uh, environmental protection. So uh, we knew the essence of re recycling nutrients, hygiene. So if you look at our texts, Sushruta Samhita, Char uh, Charaka Samhita, Manusmiti, Vayu Purana, Vastu Shastra, Kama Sutra, Artha Shastra, they all encode principles which we could have actually used to develop a code of best practices for uh, environmental protection, for waste management. Uh, but we didn't do that and of course you know why. Colonization played a big role in that. So, uh, there was a concept of general hygiene in terms of bathing, uh, not just that bathing, washing hands and all that was of course a given. Even sexual hygiene was so well explained and understood. And we are talking about a time when the idea of this has not crossed the minds of anyone else in, a, in any other part of the country, uh, any part of the world. So, we also knew about, uh, about uh, isolating disease causing pathogens in feces and uh, from the human settlements. We knew that feces which cause disease should be nowhere near the place where we eat or live. That was well understood. We knew that nutrients had to be recycled back to nature. Under no circumstances are human waste, blood or hazardous substances to be allowed to contaminate water. Look at this from Charaka Samhita that shows the intelligence of the people of that time. The river having water polluted with soil and feces, insects, snakes and rats and carrying rainwater will aggravate all doshas. Slimy having insects impure, full of leaves, moss and mud having abnormal color and taste, viscous and foul smelling water is not wholesome. Now this might look like, oh common sense, everybody would know it, but no, you will soon come to know that people in Europe didn't know about this. This was very uncommon sense that we had. Manusmriti, 
Let him not throw urine or feces into the water, nor saliva, nor clothes defiled by impure substances, nor any other impurity, nor blood, nor poisonous things. The next one. Far from his dwelling, let him remove urine and ordure. Ordure was excreta. Far let him remove the water used for washing his feet, and far the remnants of food and the water from his bath. I'm sorry I didn't put the Sanskrit ones because I knew, I know I, can't, I couldn't have pronounced it, so I've given you the English translation. But basically, all these verses are saying, keep all your excreta away from the place where you uh, live, where you eat. Just let it, be, let it go far away. So, th there was a thorough understanding of what are the impure substances produced by human bodies. And you, you will think, it's actually amazing if you go and look at the literature in uh, other languages. This understanding was not there. They have actually listed the things which, if you touch them, you have to wash your hands, you have to cleanse yourself. Semen, blood, urine, feces, nasal mucus, ear wax, phlegm, I don't know why phlegm came twice, but tears, sweat. So all this was understood as impure and if you touch any of these things, you must thoroughly wash your hands, wash yourself. Now the question comes, why did the Vedic people go for open defecation? So that's for you, of course, it's very obvious. Uh, because in those days, there were plenty of places which were far away from habitation. So. If you want, if you do not want to contaminate food with fecal matter, what you, what you should do is to go far away and do your job. Uh, you can cover it up with soil so that no insects will come from there and spread infection. Uh, and then you use the left hand to clean yourself and uh, you wash it with uh, whatever soap was. That they used plant-based soaps uh, or they used sand. And then you will not use that hand for eating. That, was, that showed a lot of intelligence. But then, see, a time came when the, the population increased so much that open defecation was not sensible or uh, sustainable, right? Uh, so it became harder to find sequestered places. There was no far away from habitation because if you went far away, you were near to the next village. So it doesn't make sense to uh, defecate in a place where, uh, you know, it can get into the groundwater there or it can, uh, you know, the flies can go into the homes over there. So at that point of time, it was not the right thing to do. And that point of time came, I think, around the 19th or 20th century. That was the time maybe we should have moved away from open defecation and gone into other uh, systems, but still in line with uh, recycling nutrients and using less water. And I think that would have happened if we were not interrupted by colonization. So the time was ripe for transitioning into eco-sand toilets with decentralized sanitation, which had once been practiced in the Indus Saraswati civilization. It had actually started, but it wasn't taken forward. This, was a, um, this is a picture of a drain at uh, Lothal, which is a part of the Indus Saraswati uh, civilization. So they had uh, toilets which were like holes in the ground, and uh, some of them had seats also to sit on. And then, uh, so the, they would use a pour flush method. So they would just pour a little bit of water so that it goes into the, uh, through the terracotta, uh, uh, terracotta channel. And then it would be taken, it will go into a brick lined pit. And there it would settle for some time and then the liquid would, would, uh, would be taken away. That liquid would not be so polluted because this, it has settled down, the solids have settled down. And then that water could be used uh, for irrigation or something. But it would not go into water, into rivers, not into holy rivers. And manually, I think some people were cleaning the pits from time to time. Uh, so that is how it would have worked in, uh, during the Saraswati civilization. So, so unlike the uh, rural dwellers, so we saw that the rural dwellers would go out and uh, defecate in the open away from habitation, cover it up. That was the way did, they did it. But the urban people had uh, these kind of uh, poor flush toilets and drains. Uh, so the Indus Saraswati people were the earliest to use latrines, soak pits, cesspools, pipes and channels for wastewater disposal. Some toilets had holes in the ground, I said all that. Uh, effluents were collected in pits uh, lined with clay bricks. Me, uh, let me tell you that it's not just in the Indus uh, Saraswati uh, sites that you find these kind of uh, uh, terracotta pipes and soak pits. You find them also in Takshashila, Delhi, Ujjain and Arikamedu. And I think if we, if we do more excavations, it will reveal uh, more ancient towns with well-developed wastewater management systems. I won't be surprised at all. Now, Arikamedu was a center for textile production and a lot of it used to be exported to uh, Roman, uh, uh, Roman uh, cities. And uh, so it has the distinction of featuring industrial wastewater systems, not just domestic, industrial wastewater systems. And it, uh, as I mentioned, it had close re relations with uh, Rome. 
Now, this was an article which simply infuriated me. New York Times a few years ago, and uh, and then it, get, it was reproduced in many other uh, papers. There was a study which said that uh, you know Indian uh, Indian uh, malnutrition was rooted in open defecation, which came from Hindu texts. I don't know. You must you might have followed it at that time. And there was this statement which said. Open defecation has long been an, an issue in India. Some ancient Hindu texts advise people to relieve themselves far uh, from home, a practice that Gandhi sought to curb. Nowhere there was an attempt to explain to people that this was actually a healthy and intelligent practice of that time. Uh, and now it needs to be discontinued because of the population. But they made it seem like there are some idiots who don't know that they should not be defecating in the open. And you know, Gandhi had, was trying to train them, but they didn't learn. And we now, you know, Western countries have to train them. And, fund them for this. That's the thinking even today. But let me tell you about this wonderful theory that the Europeans had right until the 20th century almost, the miasma theory. Ten minutes, I'll finish, don't worry. Three minutes, oops. So the miasma theory is now obsolete. It, it believes that diseases are caused by smells. So, uh, you know, there was a cholera outbreak uh, uh, at that time in the 19th century. and. Uh, so uh, before that, the, the belief was that if you get bad smells, you're going to fall sick. So they didn't know about bacteria, germs, or anything like that. And uh, so excreta was dangerous only because of its smell, and that's why it caused disease. And so when the flush toilet was introduced, um, they were very happy because they said, now the smell is going away from our houses, and so that is going to reduce disease. Well, all that, the waste from the, uh, from the flush toilet was going into the Thames River, and then uh, that water was coming back to them in their water, drinking water and they were all falling sick. There was a huge cholera outbreak, a lot of them died, but they did not connect it with the, with the flush toilets which was putting uh, feces into the Thames River. In fact, there was a huge uh, uh, rise in the sale of flush, uh, flush toilet systems because they said it's good for health. And uh, the Times reported in 1858 that death rate had declined because the Thames had grown fuller. Imagine, just look at this level of knowledge and what we found in Manusmriti and other ancient texts. Uh, so total ignorance about the fact that when the tide in the North Sea rose, the filth in the Thames was going back upstream to the drinking water intakes. Uh, and so look at this, I just want to read this out uh, from this a book by Sonia Shah. Nevertheless, under the powerful influence of miasmatism, when cholera struck, Londoners believed it was not because too many flush toilets dumped human waste into the river, but because too few did. Flush toilet sales uh, enjoyed remarkable growth in, uh, according to an 1857 report. Now let me quickly go because we don't have. So what if India had not been colonized? So given the tendency that we wanted to use less water for, uh, for cleaning ourselves and for the waste, um, we would probably have gravitated towards ecological sanitation uh, and then we would have used, thought of probably using them as fertilizers uh, and probably energy, bioenergy. Or we, we would definitely not have come up with a system which sends water, wastewater from toilet to rivers like Saraswati or Ganga. It could not have originated in ancient India. So uh, if engineers globally devised a set of best practices out of the Vedic strictures of not mixing human waste with clean water, not sending wastewater to fresh bodies, and ensuring that nutrients were safely recycled back to nature, we would have had a healthier world today, healthier and livable. So now eco sand toilets are actually being pushed into rural areas. There are lots of NGOs which are trying to make them adopted. And uh, Bill and Melinda, Melinda Gates Foundation has put a lot of money into it. Um, and so they're all demonst demonstrating how we can have a virtuous cycle where your waste is being converted into fertilizer or energy. And you know, you're not contaminating water too much beyond, beyond a little level because you have to use some water to clean yourself. Well, actually, it is all intic concepts. Intic concepts are now being taught to people in the rural areas, but nobody knows that they are Indic. They are coming from all these Bill Gates Foundation and all that. That's the way it is going. So my concluding thoughts are that the world will continue to be divided between those who are connected to the sewerage grid and those who are not. Because in India, for example, 50% of the people in India don't have access to sewers or uh, you know, a flush toilet or treatment plants. So for them, there, there is going to be a different system. But the big cities, of course, they want to go for flush toilets because that is that is the way we think we should be living. It's modern living. So it's impossible to reverse the centuries of mismanagement and uh, you know the colonized thinking. Uh, but we have moved very far away from the wisdom of ancient rishis when it comes to answering the call of nature. But there is a window of opportunity to find the right paradigm for those who are not connected to sewer networks. 
That's all I have to say. Thank you.